This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome to Making Leadership Work on Think Tech, and I'm your host today, Carol Mon Lee. Our show today is called Jill Takuda, candidate for lieutenant governor. And we're going to talk with Jill uh, about her vision and effective leadership. Speaking, speaking higher office takes more <laughs> than just dedication and hard work. <laughs> So if you want to ask a question or make a comment, you can contact us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 808-374-2014. Senator Dakuda is the representative is from Senate District 4, which mm -hmm. is? It's the Kanuhi Kailua area, so Winward Oahu, where right. I grew up. Yes. Great. And she is running for lieutenant governor in the 2018 race. Mm -hmm. How does she distinguish herself from the other candidates? Well, we'll discuss that and some of her other accomplishments as senator. So welcome. Thank you. Jill. Good to see you. Good to see you. We've worked for years in the past <laughs> on, uh, yes. when you were chair of, of uh, education yes. in the mm -hmm. Senate. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about how long have you been in the state Senate? Well, it's been 11 years. Um, it's amazing how quickly time flies, mm -hmm. but it's been 11 really uh, great, very humbling years to mm -hmm. um, be with my colleagues in the Senate sharing everything from, as you mentioned, education to agriculture and Hawaiian affairs the last three years as Ways and Means, right. which gives you an amazing opportunity to see um, the entire landscape of issues, right. um, all of the different departments, as well as having to really rein in all the resources of the state and mm -hmm. really look at where the priorities should be placed, right. uh, especially since it comes out of all of our pockets and has to be balanced on the backs of taxpayers, which is a very humbling uh, decision-making process, I assure you, and that really gave me some very interesting, uh, very tough decisions that I had to make as well. And so, well, that... well tell us about some of those tough decisions. <laughs> so, um, maybe some of the successes and some of the failures. What have you, in your last 11 years, what do you consider your major accomplishments? You know, um, it, that has probably been the toughest thing to do is, is take a look back at your entire career, if you would say, you know, the last 11 years, and really point back to some of those things that were the highlights and where are those things that you'd really want to uh, continue on. You know, education especially was a big, continues to be a big passion uh -huh. for me. You know, I'm the mother of, of two little boys. At the end of the day, the beginning of each morning, I'm a working mom. And so what, and so what specifically, <laughs> what legislative bills passed that uh, you were very involved in and uh, feel very proud about? When it comes to education, one of the things that I really recall working very hard on um, was early learning. Early and learning. putting in place, for example, um, the framework for our early learning system. Uh, because I do believe that making sure that our youngest of Keiki, they have to have um, the building blocks for success when they start kindergarten. That is so important. It was a huge success for us to put in place that executive office on early learning. At the same time, while that was a success, putting that together, to me, that was one of the things that we have left on the table that we have to continue to do more So. On. So when was that? When did that pass? That passed and that was put into place back um, in, in the beginning of 2012. We were, it was a series of years when we really took a look at putting that office into place and rolling out continued funding for it. Even um, over the last few years in putting additional funding on the table for those public pre-K classrooms, mm -hmm. as well as making sure that there was resources for family child interactive learning programs as well. Mm -hmm. So it's been a continuous work in progress, but to me, we're not moving fast enough. When right. you take a look at our youngest of children that don't have access to highly effective, high quality early learning opportunities in their own backyards, start kindergarten without those experiences, that is not fair. Right. You're already um, starting them without that strong foundation. And right. you know, when I start the school year off every morning and I walk my babies to school um, every day, you can tell that there's some kids that just haven't had those opportunities and that's really not fair for them. And it's going to show as the years go on. And um, to me, that, again, was a success. But that was also an area where we did not do enough. And we have to continue to do more um, in those particular areas. Um, OK, well, let's talk about I, I appreciate hearing about that. But mm -hmm. um, I know one thing that I've been very interested in is the Women's Caucus and yes. your work in the Women's mm -hmm. Caucus. So tell us a little bit about the accomplishments and maybe some of the failures in that area. You know, I think the Women's Caucus has um, really been a bright spot mm -hmm. to me over the last few years. To tell our audience, and what I, is the Women's Caucus? <laughs> you know, um, I wish there was actually more publicity about the I Women's Caucus. I think we caucus. have a picture. Let's see, we have some <laughs> images of um, your your time at the legislature. Uh, 
Okay, well, we'll wait for that to come up. And, so tell us a little <laughs> well, more. You know, to talk about it, uh, the Women's Caucus has, has really a, a long history going back where it's a bipartisan effort in the legislature where women lawmakers um, come together, whether Republican or Democratic, we sit at the same table. And, and I understand we, City Council are also And City now. Council as well. Um, so Councilmember Kobayashi, um, Councilmember Fukunaga. Some of them have sat in our building as well in the past and have now gone over to the council as well. It's a recognition, though, that as women leaders, uh, you know, at the legislative branch, but also as advocates, we all need to come together uh, to take a stand on those issues that we care about. And it's also a recognition that it's not just about women's issues. These cross over to issues that matter to families. They build stronger communities. So it has been um, very significant in terms of being able to move the needle on things that have made a difference. So what are a couple of the things that have... Um, whether it has been issues on domestic violence, sexual assault, have you heard... Specifically the, what? Looking I'm, at things like the, the rape kits. Mm -hmm. um, if you took at Title IX issues, um, making sure there was adequate funding for right. that at the school level, not just the university level, but at the Department of Education level. When you talk about Title IX too, for example, it's not just about sports. When Patsy Mink created Title IX, she wanted to be about equity um, across the board for educational opportunities to make sure that it was about civil rights. Right. And so it was really about doing her right, right. in compliance. And that meant putting the resources and increasing the capacity at the school level and at the university level. And in the last couple of years, in fact, this past year, we put millions of dollars towards those compliance efforts at the DOE and the university level. I think it really took the Women's Caucus, working with advocates, to put a push towards that. And it took having the right um, Women's Caucus members chairing the right committees to say that this is what we need to do. We had key members of the legislature chairing key committees, whether it was health committees, whether it was the money committees, whether we had partners at the city council, council women that were there pushing for other initiatives. Being there at the table, chairing different committees, meant that we could really stand up on those issues of importance to women and families, caregivers. You take a look at uh, the first ever Kapuna Caregivers Program in the country that Hawaii is now being hailed for as a leader. Um, and we're breaking ground on it now, and we have to come back and still move forward on this. So this is something that you and the Women's Caucus spearheaded in terms this of This is something that's passage. been worked on for decades. Yeah. <laughs> this is not something new mm -hmm. um, in terms of really having a push behind it, but actual passage and where you're seeing forward movement on. Again, sometimes it takes having the right key individuals in the right roles and having um, people come together to say that this is important. The Women's Caucus is a gathering place for both ideas, and it's a place where we can add our collective strength to issues that matter. So are there some issues that are still, as you say, on the table or that you uh, see for uh, ongoing legislative uh, efforts? You know, I think there's one thing that we recognize um, as individual leaders and collectively as a caucus is that um, the fight never ends <laughs> on right. so many of these things, and we have to always be vigilant. Um, and that, like peeling back layers of an onion, uh, as when you think you've got through one thing, you're going to find another, right? Which is great, because I think when you look at the caucus, you have some very strong advocates, and you've got tough people who are always looking to try to make sure that uh, this is not just surface in terms of our advocacy. We want to make sure this really gets done and gets done well. So when we're looking at various issues in terms of even um, paid leave issues, paid leave. when you take a look at what does it require to really make sure that you have equity um, in the workplace, um, you know, making sure that people have the supports they need at home and other things. Um, the fight's not done and we have to keep continuing, you know, so there's a lot of issues that are ongoing and that continue to need our support. Um, and a lot of times it's not just money, it's policy issues. Um, in some cases it may not even be the passages of laws, it will be culture changes and shifts in the workplace mm -hmm. and in government first and foremost as the example. So it may be conversations that we're having um, amongst ourselves and with departments and also looking at what legislative shifts can take place. I think there's some exciting potentials with paid leave. There were some discussions last year. There's some studies that are going to be coming out that could really um, change the landscape 
you know, and that has its effects in so many other areas and so many other dynamics. Right. Um, do you do you consider yourself a feminist? You know, I I think most of us do consider ourselves um, feminists, but first and foremost, I think we believe that we're there to advocate and empower um, people, our people. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think for myself, especially as a mother of two boys, I believe that when we um, lift up women, we, we all rise, you right. know, the tide um, lifts all bolts. Right. So there, there's that uh, saying, right? So for myself, I do believe that, um, whether you call it feminism, or it's the belief that um, when we advocate for these kinds of policies, it's good for, for everyone. Community. It's a, it, we build stronger communities. We build stronger families, right. you know? Um, you know, when I raise, and I look at how I'm raising um, our two sons, it's without a gender bias. Right. And, and sometimes okay. it's a, a, a criticism, uh -huh. you know, from some, perhaps. But to me, that's the way it should be. Right. It's about competency. It's about the character. You know, it's about the kind of quality of life that we want for our children and our families. And I think when we do these things and put forward these policies, it benefits not just women. It benefits every right. one. Well, let me, let's, let's move into, we all know you're running for a lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know there, it's a large field, right? <laughs> and yes. what was the latest poll? I, I read one poll that you were in the lead. Is that mm -hmm. still the case? You know, um, there have been a few polls. Yes. You know, but we're still, as I tell people, seven and a half or eight months out from the primary election. Um, and they have been favorable. Good. But I, as I tell everyone, I never take anything for granted. And how big um, is the uh, pool of candidates right now? Geez, right now, <laughs> we probably have about six or, right. or seven candidates um, in the race. By the time filing actually takes place, you could have more right. at that particular point. And so. I know several of the other candidates, and of course our current governor, mm -hmm. all had background, have background in the legislature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell me how you distinguish yourself between, um, let's say, even the current governor mm -hmm. and um, the other candidates and your, your particular experience mm -hmm. in the role. You know, um, briefly, briefly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I think that is going to be the challenge, right? When you've got um, potentially anywhere from seven to eight candidates that will be on the ballot at the election, and people are going to just be looking at a list from A to, to T. And, and by the way, being T, I feel like an old school board of education, not to bring up what you use <laughs> right. on, right? But I'm going to be T right there um, towards the end of the list, likely. And, and that is the great question. How do you distinguish yourself? I think for my, for me, just like every time I've run um, in my Senate seat, um, I can't help but just be me. Okay. I think to me it is about trying to be authentic to who you are. You know, like I said from the beginning, I'm a, I'm a working mom. Well, and how is your preparation? Um, well, maybe let's say, how are you preparing for the role of lieutenant governor? And actually, mm -hmm. as we all know, in stepping up to governor, whether it's uh, by choice later on right. or because of um, circumstances. Right. So what have you been doing to prepare for the, that leadership role? Right. You know, I do believe that the last uh, few years, especially in the chairships that I have had, have definitely put me in a, in a very good position to prepare for that kind of But of beyond role. that, beyond, of course, your role mm -hmm. as a chair of Ways and Means mm -hmm. and in the Senate, but beyond the Senate, because we all know that um, as governor, you're, or in lieutenant governor, mm -hmm. your, your jurisdiction is much broader, right? And yeah. in the neighbor islands, and of course, yeah. national issues mm -hmm. come here and yeah. uh, so and and how and how have you been preparing for um, a role that might include those types of responsibilities? Yeah. You know, I think um, for myself, I do believe that in everything that I have been doing over the years, it has been a constant preparation um, for what's next. You know, I've been very blessed and fortunate that even in my own district, it is a very diverse um, population. You know, and I've always been, by being very authentic and true to myself, been able to relate um, well with individuals, um, speaking with them individually. Um, you know, sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't, but just being able to um, connect with them. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I'm thinking more formally, and I'm bringing back something from a, the last uh, presidential election mm -hmm. when um, Katie Couric, I believe, interviewed Sarah Palin, who was running for vice president, yeah. and she asked Sarah Palin, what do you read on a daily basis? What kind of newspapers, journals, mm -hmm. magazines? And so I'm just wondering, um, what do you read to keep up with local, national, international mm -hmm. events and, and issues? 
What do I? Re yeah, really. Well, Thank fortunately, you. I just don't follow Twitter um, uh, oh, <laughs> because good. I don't I think don't that that's, a, that's the way to do it. But definitely for myself, it, it is about making sure that I am up to date on you know what's going on nationally. You know, even conversing with a congressional delegation on a very regular basis in terms of what's going on there. Um, one of the things that I did make sure that I um, kept in good communication on, especially with a lot of the things that are going on at the federal level right now, is whether they were home or even um, when they were in D.C., was kept in touch with, um, you know, whether it was our U.S. senators or uh, the representatives, found out what's going on right now, how do we need to be prepared? Right. Um, and more importantly, how can we be proactive about what might come up? Because a legislative session, for us at least, at least in the role I currently am in, is only a small window in time. Right. So knowing that, how can we be prepared to help Hawaii? Because for citizens, they don't know the difference between a federal program and a state program right. or a county program. So in many cases, we have to be very proactive. Also, and on that note, mm -hmm. Senator, I'm going to ask us to hold for a second. Okay. We're going to go through a commercial break, and we'll get back to the more specific issues. And we'll be right back after the break. Thank you. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Winston Welch. And every other Monday at 3 p.m., you can join me at Out and About a show where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. So please join us every other Monday at 3, and we'll see you then. Aloha. Uh, welcome back. This is Karaman Lee on Making Leadership Work with my special guest, Senator mm -hmm. Jill Takuda, who is running for lieutenant governor in the 2018 race. So thank you for thank coming. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we were talking about some of the national uh, the ways you keep up with what's going on on mm -hmm. a national level. So I was wondering, um, specifically, have you, um, do you have thoughts about, let's say, on a state level, the prison system? I know that's come up lately about establishing a new prison, and I know that that was something that the governor mm -hmm. would be responsible for. So do you have any thoughts on that particular issue? You know, I definitely know that that's a huge issue that needs very focused attention on. One of the things that we did look very closely at over the last few sessions has been the operating cost of the prison system mm -hmm. and how sustainable is it. Um, in fact, if you take a look at the last few budget cycles and some of the proposals that we did specifically that came out of my committee, we did look at the overtime issues mm -hmm. and how sustainable that was and made um, some very specific um, recommendations on ways that we could really start to clamp down on um, some of those um, and try to work with the administration to try to get a handle on um, spending yeah. in, in many cases because one, we want to help them create um, a system that is supportive, but it has to be manageable from a, a fiscal standpoint of course. as well because as we know, um, the costs that go into it comes out of the pockets of other programs. And so, relating to other programs, how do you rank the prison issue with regard to everything else that the governor and lieutenant governor would have to face? What would you consider the, the major, the top three issues that, as a lieutenant governor and governor, that you would want to have input in and, and be able to affect? Well, I think you have to look at it um, balanced out with everything else. You're right. If a program is looking at tens of billions of dollars or upwards of 10 millions of dollars in over time. It's coming out of the pockets of education. It's coming out of the pockets of whether or not you can afford a long-term care program for your seniors, right? It is all connected whether you like it or not. If you cannot somehow create a, a program that is helping to reduce recidivism for the individuals who are in the criminal justice system, then they're just going to be going back in. So it really is about looking at, do you have an effective prison or criminal justice system mm -hmm. um, or not? And so it is um, about trying to get a root, um, get a good handle 
on public safety. It's actually one of the smaller departments out of all of the executive branch agencies and departments, but by no means is it insignificant. So the governor really has to look at prioritizing everything. And where there might be one area where he needs to drill down deeper, that could be an opportunity to delegate it to a lieutenant governor to say, you need to go work on this area and drill down with the various departments and agencies to make sure that we can do better and should be doing better in this particular area, whether it be um, you know, the prison system and justice reinvestment, and even looking at the overtime and staffing issues, would there be something like the state hospital and what we just saw right. um, recently? Because it's mm -hmm. not just about escapes there. Mm -hmm. It is about the operational of costs course. there. We've been looking at that for years. And it's connected even to community-based mental health, something that I was looking at for many years in connection with the state hospital. Because why are they so crowded there? Why do we have homeless on the street that are dealing with mental health and substance abuse? If you don't have enough capacity at either the state hospital or in our community-based mental health system, where do they end up? Right. On the street. So if you don't have the time as the executive, the chief executive, to run all of your departments at the same time, you should be delegating this to drill down deeper to your second in command. And that's usually no, how okay. it should work. Right. And, and so I mean, that's the real opportunity for myself, having seen where these kinds of opportunities exist, where you can have better collaboration and efficiencies, especially between departments, um, where some of these pockets lie and when where some of these inefficiencies lie, especially from a budgetary standpoint, that's the exciting part for me because where we can reduce some of the spending, see some of these efficiencies, then you can take those resources and put it where you really need it, right. whether it be education or seniors or other things. So that's the exciting opportunity to me to have a functional executive with a chief executive and a lieutenant governor working as two strong uh, leaders for the state. Mm -hmm. So officially, though, that's not part of the responsibility of the lieutenant governor, right? That would have to be almost a negotiation between the governor and the lieutenant A negotiation, governor. but also you need to have a lieutenant governor who can identify exactly where these opportunities So are. how do you work with the current governor and the next, the other, <laughs> and candidates for governor? I think I've been very blessed that I've worked with both of them for mm -hmm. many, many years. So both, we're talking about Governor Ige and uh, current representative Colleen Hanabusa. Yeah, both of them in the Senate. Um, you know, I've had relationships with them while they were both serving in the Senate. Um, Colleen, when she was Senate president, um, you know, Governor Ige when he was in the Senate, and actually Governor Ige and I um, have known each other from when he was education chair in the House, mm -hmm. and I was a student, <laughs> so we go back um, even further. You know, he was very young, though, I must say, when, when, he you was, were very young. <laughs> when we were starting out. But my relationship with both of them um, go back quite some ways, and I think I'm very fortunate that we have a good open relationship in the sense that we may not always agree, but we can have that good conversation, open conversation about what we think should be done. And they are very familiar with my style and my abilities. And, well. and how is your relationship with the neighbor islands? Because as a state, state center, you really don't have to uh, be involved on a regular basis. Right. So. No. You know, um, I agree, but you know, that was one thing that was very important for me as a chair in all of my capacities. Um, even as education chair, you know, one of the things that was important to me was that I got the perspectives of the principals um, on a number of things. So when it came to, for example, looking at the way to student formula, which is a very contentious issue about funding, you know, I did a statewide tour and talked to all of the principals in the state um, and went and met with them for hours and went um, island to island and met with them. Every principal. Um, what are and the even biggest vice issues facing the neighbor islands? Or? For many of them, it's equity. It, it was... Um, equity in well, terms it was, of... There was the feeling back then, and it's been a few years, it was equitable, it was not adequate in terms, in terms of, of the funding. Mm -hmm. There was concerns about the adequacy of the funding. Um, the equity, for the most part, it was distributed um, you know, equitably across the board but it was a huge adequacy issue. There was not enough funding, especially for all the different kinds of mandates that were coming down from the federal level, um, from what they saw from the state level. Uh, there was a lot of additional burdens being placed on to the principal. For many of them, they got into being a principal to be academic leaders for the school, and they were finding themselves being you know, in charge of 
you know, projects, you know, maintenance projects and HR directors and IT directors and all these other things. And lost was what they originally got into educating for, right? They wanted to teach children and to, to grow minds. And that was not what they were finding at the end of the day. But that was really a big thing for me to be able to go to each island and be able to listen to literally hundreds of different perspectives. But go to them, not have them come to me. In some cases, we had maybe one or two video conferences, but it was important for me to go to them and listen, even see the distance it took to drive to some charter schools and see you take an hour and a half to get somewhere. Right. But beyond education issues um, for the neighbor islands as governor, lieutenant governor, what, and um, you said mentioned equity, are there other important um, areas that you would like to see improved or? or Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's many. And, and, I, and I was able to really also um, see some of that um, for the last few years as Ways and Means Chair for the grant and aid process, for example, um, realized that it was very difficult for most people to come to the hearing at the auditorium. You get three minutes <laughs> to give your spiel right. and in front of an auditorium of people and you might be at the end of a five hour process at that particular point. So set up um, listening stops on each island. Um, and it was tough because for the most part, each person, each group only got about 10 minutes or so. But I did um, sit downs on each island and I would sit for about five, six hours on each island for the last couple of years and just give them a chance to meet one-on-one -on -one with me and usually the senators from that island. But I wanted them to have a chance to not have to pay and oftentimes of the course. trip to Oahu to have one-on-one -on -one time with me and just talk about what they do and, and why their mission was important. And for me, it was about coming to them and it was getting their perspectives of how they want to partner with government and what they do for their community. That led a great deal. That was extremely important for me to also see how we could do better through partnerships in many different aspects of government, not just education, um, but in all the different divisions and departments that we work through. And again, um, what the needs um, are in each community statewide on all the islands um, and how those needs are often being met in partnerships with the government, but in oftentimes um, through community-based organizations as well. Right. Well, we only have a few more seconds left, <laughs> Senator. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to look into camera four and say <laughs> something to our audience. Um, Again, we're speaking with Senator Jill Takuda, who is running for lieutenant governor in the 2018 race. So the uh, camera is all yours for a few seconds. <laughs> well, I just really want to thank you for this opportunity to chat with you and to your viewers and just say that this is really going to be um, a, a really amazing opportunity for to have democracy in action with so many candidates running for the lieutenant governor position. And it really is a critical position in that we need two strong people. Uh, in the executive branch because there's so many problems and issues facing our state that no one person can take it on alone. Um, and for myself, like I said, I'm a working mother at the end of the day. It's the lens in which I see the world. And every day for myself, it was about walking my two little children to school. And I couldn't help but feel that sense of urgency that if we don't do something, if we don't step up, you know, we as families, we're not going to be able to make it here. Um, you know, for all intensive purposes, all the economic indicators look great. You know, we've got, you know, planes full of tourists flying in, virtual unemployment and construction looks all right. But if you just scratch a little bit below the surface, you can feel the struggle. Right. And I think for most of us, it really is about knowing that after we work hard from a long day's you know, work, that when we go home to that kitchen table and we all sit down, you know, and we try to balance it all out, we just want to know, is government working? just as hard as the rest of us to make it balance out. Right. You know, and for myself, it was about stepping up and making sure that they know that they had somebody just like them that was going to work just as hard. And that's really what it's about. It's for our families. It's for our kids. And you know, I think 2018 is going to be the year when we make sure that um, we take care of our families just like we take care of our own. So thank you for this opportunity, and okay. I think 2018 is going to be a great year for all of us. Well, thank you so much, Senator, and I wish we had more time because I'd thank love you. to cover some of the tax issues that are coming up with them yeah. in the national level. Um, but we do appreciate your, your taking the time to come down. Of thank course, you. we wish you the very best. No, thank so you. Thank you, Senator. Well, today you have been watching Making Leadership Work with my special guest, Senator Jill Takuda. We've enjoyed bringing it to you, and I'm your host, Carol Monley. 
We've been talking about uh, many important issues, and if you would like to see this show, please go to thinktechhawaii.com or youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii, where you will be able to get a link to this show and many more just like this one. So thanks so much to our intrepid mm -hmm. studio staff and to all people who have watched uh, and contributed to Think Tech Hawaii. We'll see you next time, and aloha. <laughs>